Dorothy, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I can still hear those words echoing in my memory, for in a sense they changed my life. My name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and I was privileged to share the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. I will tell you how we first came across the sign of the four. I can see it still. Our rooms in Baker Street and Sherlock Holmes, and in such detail you will be there yourself. If I may collect my thoughts for just a moment. Bells of stagnation, Watson. Give me the most abstruse cryptogram or the most intricate analysis, and I'm in my own proper atmosphere. But I abhor the dull routine of existence. That's why I've chosen my own particular profession. Or rather, created it, for I'm the only one in the world. You're the only unofficial detective? The only unofficial consulting detective. The work itself is my highest reward. But, Watson, you've had some experience of my methods of work. I was never so struck by anything in my life. I even embodied the experience in a small brochure with a somewhat fantastic title of a Study in Scarlet. I read it. Honestly, I cannot congratulate you on it. Oh? Detection is or ought to be an exact science and should be treated in the same cold and unemotional manner. You have attempted to tinge it with romanticism which produces much the same effect as if you worked a love story into the fifth proposition of Euclid. But the romance was there. My practice has extended recently to the continent. I was consulted last week by Francois Lavilla, who, as you probably know, has come rather to the front lately in the French detective service. He's now translating my small works into French. Your work? <laughs> yes. I've been guilty of several monographs. Um, yeah, for example, is one upon the distinction between the ashes of the various tobaccos. In it, I enumerate 140 forms of cigar, cigarette, and pipe tobacco. 140? Here is my monograph upon the tracing of footsteps, with some remarks upon the uses of plaster of Paris as a preserver of impressions. <laughs> but I weary with my hobby. No, not at all. But you were speaking just now of observation and deduction. Surely the one, to some extent, implies the other. Oh, by no means. Observation shows me that you've been to the Wigmore Street Post Office this morning. Hmm? But deduction lets me know that when there you dispatched a telegram. Oh. Observation tells me that you have a little reddish mold adhering to your instep. Now, just opposite the Wigmore Street Post Office, they've taken up the pavement and thrown up some earth which lies in such a way that it's difficult to avoid treading in it on entering. The earth is of this peculiar reddish tint, which is found, as far as I know, nowhere else in the neighborhood. Bravo. But how did you deduce the telegram? Well, of course, I knew that you'd not written a letter since I sat opposite you all the morning. I see also in your open desk there that you have a sheet of stamps and a thick bundle of postcards. Well, what could you go into the post office for, then, but to send a wire? Eliminate all other factors, and the one which remains must be the truth. Dear me. Dear me. Dear me. See, Watson, how the yellow fog swirls down the street and drifts across the dun-colored houses? What could be more hopelessly prosaic and material? What's the use of having powers, Doctor, when one has no field upon which to exert them? Crime is commonplace, existence is commonplace... And no qualities save those which are commonplace had any function upon Earth. Uh, what is it, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, a young lady for Mr. Holmes, sir. I have no appointments. She has her card, sir. Oh, Miss Mary Morstan. I have no recollection of the name. 
Oh, very well. Ask her to step in, Mrs. Hudson. Very good, sir. Will you go in, please, Miss Morstan? Thank you. Pray come in, madam. It's good of you to see me, Mr. Holmes. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, Miss Watson? Will you take the basket chair? Oh, thank you. I've come to you, Mr. Holmes, because you once enabled my employer, Mrs. Cecil Forrester, to unravel a little domestic complication. She was much impressed by your kindness and skill. Mrs. Cecil Forrester. Oh, yes, I believe that I was of some slight service to her. Mr. Holmes, I can hardly imagine anything more strange than the situation in which I find myself. Then pray state your case. Briefly, the facts are these. My father was an officer in an Indian regiment who sent me home when I was quite a child. My mother was dead, and I had no relative in England. So I was placed in a comfortable establishment in Edinburgh. When I was 17 years of age, my father arrived in London on leave and directed me to come down at once. On reaching the Langham Hotel, I was informed that Captain Morstan had gone out the night before and had not returned. From that day to this, no word has ever been heard of my unfortunate father. Good the date? He disappeared on the 3rd of December, 1878. 1878. Nearly ten years ago. His luggage? Uh, there was nothing in it to suggest a clue. Had he any friends in London? Well, only one that we know of. Major Sholto of his own regiment, the 34th Bombay Infantry. Sholto. Major Sholto had retired some little time before my father came home. He lived at Upper Norwood. Upper Norwood? We communicated with him, of course, but he didn't even know that his brother officer was now in England. I see. I haven't yet described to you the most singular part. About six years ago, in 1882 to be exact... An advertisement appeared in the Times, asking for the address of Miss Mary Morstan. Eighteen eighty-two. I had just entered the family of Mrs. Cecil Forrester as governess, and by her advice, I published my address in the advertisement column. The same day, there arrived through the post a small cardboard box addressed to me. It contained a very large and lustrous pearl. Remarkable. No word of writing was enclosed. Every year since then, on the same date, there has come a box containing a similar pearl without any clue as to the sender. You can see for yourselves that they are very handsome. This is most interesting. Has anything else happened? Yes. This morning I received this letter. Oh, thank you. Uh, the envelope too, please. Of course. Thank you. Postmark London, SW, date July 7th. Hmm. Man's thumb mark on the corner. Probably postman. Best quality paper. Envelopes at sixpence a package. Particular man in his stationery. No address. So what does it say, though, Holmes? Be a preferred pillar from the left outside the Lyceum Theatre tonight at 7 o'clock. If you are distrustful, bring two friends. You are a wronged woman and shall have justice. Do not bring police. If you do, all will be in vain. Signed, your unknown friend. What do you intend to do, Miss Morrison? That is exactly what I want to know, Mr. Holmes. We shall most certainly go. You and I and... Yes, Dr. Watson's the very man. We've worked together before. Oh, you're both very kind... If I'm here at six, will it do? You must not be later. No. Oh, there is one point, however. Is this handwriting the same as that upon the pearl box addresses? Uh, I have them all here. You're certainly a model client. Let's see now. Uh, these are disguised hands. But they're undoubtedly by the same person. Well, we shall look out for you at six. Au revoir, then. Au revoir. Good afternoon. What a very attractive woman. My dear Watson, it's of the first importance not to allow your judgment to be biased by personal qualities. 
I assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. Yes, but in this case... I never make exceptions. An exception disproves the rule. Well, I'm going out now. I have a few references to look up. I shall be back in an hour. Dear Watson, there's no great mystery in this matter. The facts appear to admit of only one explanation. But you haven't solved it already. I've just found on consulting the backfires of the Times that Major Shalter of Upper Norwood, late 34th Bombay Infantry, died on the 28th of April, 1882. I may be very obtuse, Holmes, but I fail to see what this suggests. No? You surprise me. Captain Morstan disappears. His only acquaintance in London is Major Sholto. Four years later, Sholto dies. Within a week of his death, Captain Morstan's daughter receives a valuable present, which is repeated from year to year, and now culminates in a letter which describes her as a wronged woman. Why should the presents begin immediately after Sholto's death, unless it is that Sholto's heir knows something of the mystery and desires to make compensation? Yes, but the letter speaks of giving her justice. What justice can she have? He... It's too much to suppose her father is still alive. Mm, there are certainly difficulties. But our expedition of tonight will solve them all. Ah, I think that's a four-wheeler. Uh, yes, and, and there's Miss Morstan inside. Are you all ready? I'm ready, Holmes. Shalto was a very particular friend of Papa's. They were in command of the convict guard on the Andaman Islands. The Andaman, then? Uh, by the way, Mr. Holmes, a curious paper was found in Papa's desk. I don't suppose it's of the slightest importance, but I thought you might care to see it. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Seems to be a plan for part of a large building. At one point, uh, here, do you see? There's a small cross done in red ink. In the left-hand corner, there's a curious hieroglyphic, like four crosses in a line with their arms touching. And beside that, there's written in very rough and coarse characters, the sign of the four. Jonathan Small, Mohammed Singh, Abdullah Khan, Dost Akbar. Preserve it carefully, Miss Morstan. I shall. I suspect that this matter may turn out to be much deeper and more subtle than I at first supposed. I fancy this is our man. Are you the party who have come with Miss Morstan? I am Miss Morstan, and these two gentlemen are my friends. Ah, I was to ask you to give me your word, Miss, that neither of your companions is a policeman. I give you my word. Thank you, Miss. If you'll follow me, the cab goes. Oh, I lost my bearings ages ago. Wandsworth Road. I don't know how you'll do it, Holmes. Stop for place. Cold Harbor Lane. Dear me, our quest doesn't appear to be taking us to very fashionable regions. Coming this way, please. Your servant, Miss Morrison. Your servant, gentlemen. Mm. Pray step into my little sanctum. My name is Sadir Soto. Uh, these gentlemen... This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and this Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Oh, a doctor, eh? I'm a great sufferer, and I've long had suspicions as to my mitral valve. Had your father, Miss Morstan, refrained from throwing strain upon his heart, he might have been alive now. Well, sir, pray have some consideration for the lady. 
I knew in my heart that he was dead. Miss Walston, I can give you every information, and what is more, I can do you justice. And I will. Whatever Brother Bartholomew may say, but let us have no outsiders, no police or officials. Whatever you may choose to say, we'll go no further. Thank you. Mr. Shalto, it's getting late, and I should like the interview to be as short as possible. Well, at the best, it must take some time, for we shall certainly have to go to Norwood and see Brother Bartholomew. He's very angry with me for taking the course which has seemed right to me. Norwood, then wouldn't it be as well to start at once? Well, I must prepare you by laying the facts before you. Then pray do so, sir. Uh, my father, Major John Sholto, retired from the Indian Army some 11 years ago and came to Pondicherry Lodge, Upper Norwood, with a considerable sum of money, a large collection of valuable curiosities, and a staff of native servants. My twin brother Bartholomew and I were the only children. I very well remember the sensation which was caused by the disappearance of Captain Morstan. We read the details in the papers, but never for an instant did we suspect that my father had the whole secret hidden in his breast. We did know, however, that some mystery overhung our father. Early in 1882, my father received a letter from India which was a great shock to him. From that day, he sickened to his death. Towards the end of April, we were informed that he wished to make a last communication to us. The only one thing which weighs upon my mind at this supreme moment is my treatment of poor Marston's orphan, Mary. At least half of the treasure should have been hers. You, my sons, will give her a fair share of the Algol treasure. Father, when we were in India, Boston and I, through a remarkable chain of circumstances, came into possession of a considerable treasure and brought it over to England. And on the night of Boston's arrival, he came straight here to claim his share. We had a difference of opinion. Boston sprang out of his chair, and then he suddenly pressed his hand to his side and fell backwards. I found, to my horror, that he was dead. Good God. I was still, oh dear, stooping over him. When I saw my servant, well, Childer, in the doorway, do not fear, Saab, he said. No one need know that you have killed him. I did not kill him, said I. Well, Childer shook his head and smiled. I heard you quarreling, Saab, said he. And I heard... And I heard... And I heard to decide me if my own servant couldn't believe my innocence how could I hope to make it good before twelve foolish tradesmen in the jewelry box and then well then Childer and I disposed of the body that night and within a few days the London newspapers the full of the mysterious disappearance of Captain Boston. I... I... Father, what is it? I must tell you where the treasure is. It is hidden in... No, no! Keep him out! There, out the window! What is it? That face! That face! The sign of the fall! Can you describe the face of the window, Mr. Shalter? Uh, bearded, hairy, with cruel eyes, and an expression of concentrated evil. When we returned from the window, we found that my father's pulse had ceased to beat. In the morning, we found his window open, his cupboards and boxes rifled, and on his chest there was fixed a torn piece of paper with the words, The Sign of the Fall. Ah, Sign of the Fall. And the treasure? 
For weeks and months, my brother and I dug in every part of the garden. Oh, it was maddening to think that the hiding place was on my father's lips at the very moment he died. To this day, I have seen only one piece of it. That little chaplet over there. This? Yes, Doctor. Some of the pearls are missing from it. Well, after my father's death, I persuaded Bartholomew to let me find out Miss Norston's address and send her a detached pearl at intervals so that at least we might make part of the restitution my father had wished. That was a kindly thought, Mr. Shelton. Oh, not at all. We were your trustees. Well, that was the view I took of it. Though Bartholomew could not altogether see it in that light... So I left Pondicherry Lodge. And may I ask now, Mr. Shalter, exactly why you brought us here this evening? Because yesterday I learned that the treasure had been discovered. Discovered? It only remains for us to drive to Norwood and demand that Brother Bartholomew give us our share. I explained my views to him last night, so we should be expected, if not very welcome. Mr. Shalter, you have done well. We had best put the matter through without delay. Uh, very well, Mr. Holmes. A cab will be waiting outside. How did your brother find the treasure? Oh, Bartholomew was a clever fellow. He worked out the cubic space of the house. He found that the height of the building was 74 feet. But on adding together the heights of all the separate rooms and the spaces between, he could not bring the total to more than 70 feet. The four feet unaccounted for could only be at the top of the building. He knocked a hole in the ceiling of the highest room, and there, sure enough, the treasure chest stood in the center. He computes the value of the jewels at not less than half a million sterling. Half a million? Oh, no! Then Miss Morstan must be about the richest heiress in the country. I believe you're right, Watson. Well, let us be going. Perhaps we shall see for ourselves. Is I, McMurdo. Sure you know my lot by this time. Oh, I. That you, Mr. Thaddeus? But who are these others with you? Well, I told my brother last night that I should bring some friends. I'm very sorry, Mr. Thaddeus. I don't know any of your friends. Oh, yes, you do, McMurdo. Me? Not... Not Mr. Sherlock Holmes. In you come, sir, in you come. You and your friends. Very sorry, Mr. Thaddeus, but Master's orders are very strict. Oh, well, come along then. We've wasted enough time. If you'll just follow me, ma'am and gents, I'll light the way up to the house with my lantern. I, I can't understand it. I distinctly told Bartholomew that we should be here. And yet there's no light in his window. I see the glint of a light in that little window beside the door. Ah, that's the housekeeper's room. That is where old Mrs. Burnstone sits. What's that? What? I was sure I could... Yes, listen. Huh? It's a woman crying. You're right, my Joe. Oh, Mr. Holmes, something seems to be amiss. Oh, will you come into the house with me, please? Certainly. I think I'm a little afraid. Nothing to fear, Miss Morstan, I assure you. Would you... Would you care to take my hand? I do... Oh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, better now? Much better. Miss Morstan, I feel I, I, I... I feel we should follow them. <laughs> Oh, no, no, Mrs. Burnstone. Yes. What is the matter? Oh, oh Mr. Mr. Freddy, sir, there is something. There's something amiss with Mr. Bartholomew. My brother? He's locked himself in and won't answer me. All day I wanted to hear from him. And so an hour ago I went, went up and peeked through the keyhole. He must go up quickly. He must go up and look for yourself. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Give me your lantern, McMurdo. And you stay here with Miss Morstan. Yes, sir. Mr. Shorter, Watson, come with me quickly. Now, oh, there's his room. The first door on the left. How can we see into it if there's no light in there? Well, there's, there's plenty of moonlight. Let's see. Good heavens. 
something damnable. You take a look, Watson. Uh, he's he's just sitting there. With a horrible smile on his face. He looks inhuman. Oh, tell me. The door must come down. Right. Together, then. Uh, I'm dead. Now, this time. Now, we shall see. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. The Sign of the Four is one of the Sherlock Holmes stories by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. We're presenting it in three parts. You've just heard part one. My name is Norman Shelley. My friend Carlton Hoff played Sherlock Holmes. And I was Dr. Watson. Michael Hardwick wrote the script for this BBC production from London. Of course, I look forward to the pleasure of your company again very soon for part two of The Sign of the Four. smile on his face. He looks inhuman. The door must come down. Right. Together, then. Uh, 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 this time. So, was the sign of the four again to be the sign of death? A further mystery for my friend Sherlock Holmes. My name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and I was privileged to share the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. First, I will refresh your memory on the case so far, and then I will tell you what happened next in our investigation of the sign of the four. Concerning the disappearance of her father, Captain Morstan, ten years earlier. Each year since then, she had been receiving through the post a single large pearl. And now the anonymous sender had expressed a wish to meet her. We accompanied her to the rendezvous and heard from the eccentric fellow, Sir Dear Salto, how his father and Captain Morstan had gained a fabulous treasure which had disappeared after both their deaths. Now it had been rediscovered by his brother, Bartholomew Salto, whom we were to visit to claim Miss Morstan's rightful share. Arriving at Bartholomew's house, we found him sitting in a chair, a horrible smile on his face, and quite, quite dead. Oh, what on earth does it all mean, Mr. Holmes? It means murder. Murder? Ah, just as I expected. Look here, Watson. Stuck in the skin, just above his ear. A long, dark thorn. Be careful. He's poisoned. Poisoned? Oh! What a fantastic mystery, Holmes. On the contrary, my dear Watson. I only require a few missing links, and I shall have an entirely connected oh. case. Oh! Oh! Mr. Sholto, what is it? Oh, the, the treasure. It's gone. Are you sure? Oh, there is the hole in the ceiling. We lowered it through. I helped him to do it. I left him here last night, and I heard him lock the door. The treasure was locked in this room with him. What time did you leave? It was ten o'clock. Oh, dear me. Now the police will suspect me of having a hand in it. Take my advice, Mr. Sholto. Drive down to the police station and report the matter. The, the police station? Offer to assist them in every way. We shall wait here until you return. But I... Now, please do as I say. It will be for the best. Oh, very well. I suppose you know best. Oh, dear, oh, dear. 
<laughs> now, Watson, we have a little while to ourselves. Let us make good use of it. Very well, Holmes. In the first place, let us consider how these folk came and how they went. Now, Shalto reckoned the door hasn't been opened since last night. Then how about the window? Mm -hmm. No, it's fastened on the inside. Solid framework. I'll just open it. Hmm. No water pipe near. Roof quite out of reach. Yet a man mounted by the window. Uh, how do you know? Here is the print of a foot in the mould upon the sill. And here is a circular muddy mark. See here again on the floor. And here again by the table. That's not a footmark. It's something much more valuable to us. These are the impressions of a wooden stump. A wooden leg man. But there's been someone else here. Oh? Could you scale that wall yourself? Mm, let's see. Whoa, certainly not. A good 60 feet from the ground, another foothold all the way. But supposing you had a friend up here who lowered you that good stout rope which I see in the corner. Mm. Then, if you were an active man, you might swarm up wooden leg and all. Of course, you'd depart in the same fashion, and your ally would draw up the rope, shut the window, secure it from the inside, and depart in the way that he originally came. Yes, but look here, this, this accomplice, how did he get in? The door's locked, the window is inaccessible... Did he come down the chimney? The grate's much too small. Well, then, how? My dear Watson, how often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. He didn't come through the door, the window, or the chimney. He couldn't have been concealed in the room as there is no concealment possible. Then where did he come from? Through the hole in the roof. Of course he did. Now, if you will have the kindness to hold the lamp for me, we shall now extend our researches to the secret room above where the treasure was found. Can you can you manage to get up? I I fancy I can just get up on this rafter. Uh, good. Now I'm coming up too. Is it right? Ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, uh, there. Here you are. You see. Oh, there's a flat door leading out onto the roof. I fancy I can press it back. Yes. And the roof slopes at a gentle angle. Ah, this is how he got in, then. Now, let's see if we can find some other traces of this queer individual. It doesn't look as though this place has been entered for years. <laughs> how did dust... Ah, but oh. even dust has its uses. Look at these footprints. As clear as we could wish... But these are the prints of a child's naked foot. Holmes, a child has done this horrid thing. Come along, Watson. There's nothing more to be learned here. Mm -hmm. If my memory hadn't failed me, I should have been able to forestall this. Now, uh, 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 where do I put my lens? Uh, here it is. Oh, thank you. Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah, we're certainly in luck. What does it know? Our naked-footed friend has had the misfortune to tread in this creosote that has leaked out of the carboy there in the corner. You can see the outline of the edge of his small foot here. Well, then, why? We've got him, that's all. I know a dog that would follow that scent to the world's end. Hello, here come the accredited representatives of the law. <laughs> now, before they come, Watson... Just put your hand here on this poor dead fellow's arm. Yes. And here on his leg? Yes. What do you feel? The muscles are as hard as a board. Quite so. They're in a state of extreme contraction, far exceeding the usual rigor mortis. Coupled with this distortion of the face, what conclusion would it suggest to your mind? Oh, death from some powerful vegetable alkaloid. Some strychnine-like substances which uh, produce tetanus. As you saw, I discovered a thorn which had been driven or shot with no great force into the scalp. You observed that the part struck was that which would be turned towards the hole in the ceiling if the man were erect in his chair. Uh, now, then, examine this thorn. You go first, Mr. Shorter. Hmm, it looks as though some gummy substance has dried on it. Quite so. But is that an English thorn? Oh, no. No, it certainly is not. Then with all these data, you should be able to draw some inference. 
Now, but here, the regular so the auxiliary forces may beat on the tree. Here's a pretty business. The house seems to be as full as a rabbit warren. Ah, Mr. Jones. You must recollect me. Indeed I do. It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the theorist. <laughs> Remember you? I'll never forget the Bishop's get jewel case. Ah. But uh, what's all this? Bad business. Stern facts here. No room for theories. Lucky I happened to be out at Norwood on another case. What do you think the man died of? Oh, this is hardly a case for me to theorize. Uh, no, no. Still, we can't deny that you hit the nail on the head uh, sometimes. Uh, door locked, I understand. Jewels worth half a million missing. How was the window? Fastened. But there are footmarks on the sill. Well, if it was fastened, they could have had nothing to do with the matter. Oh. Oh, I see. Ah, I've got it. These flashes come upon me at times. Uh, just step outside, Sergeant. Yes, sir. And you, please, Mr. Sholto? Oh, very well. I shall go mad. I'm sure I shall go mad. Inspector, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you? He's assisting me. May he remain? Yes, yes, I suppose so. Uh, now, Mr. Holmes, Sholto was with his brother last night... The brother died in a fit, and Sholto walked off the treasure. How's that? Upon which the dead man very considerately got up and locked the door on the inside. Mm, yes, yes, there's a flaw there. You're not in possession of all the facts, eh? Huh? This splinter of wood, which I had every reason to believe to be poisoned, was in the man's scalp, where you still see the mark. There, you see? Ah, yes. This card inscribed the sign of the four was on the table. How does all that fit into your theory? If this splinter's poisonous, that Dias may well have made murderous use of it. The card is some um, hocus-pocus, blind as like as not. I see. The only question is... Oh, there is a question, then. The question is, how did he get out? Ah, of course. Here's a hole in the roof. You see, facts are better than theories after all. There's a trap door communicating with the roof, and it's partly open. I opened it. You? Oh, well, uh, no matter. It shows how our gentleman got away. Sergeant? Yes, sir? Ask Mr. Sholto to step this way. Very good, sir. This way, sir, if you please. Mr. Thaddeer Sholto? Yes. It's my duty to inform you that anything which you say may be used against you. I arrest you in the Queen's name as being concerned in the death of your brother. Oh, then I... Didn't I tell you what they would say? Don't trouble yourself, Mr. Sholto. I think I can engage to clear you of this charge. Oh, you can, Mr. Holmes. Don't promise too much, Mr. Theorist. You may find it a harder matter than you think. Not only will I clear him, Mr. Jones, but I'll make you a free present of the name and description of one of the two people who were in this room last night. His name, I have every reason to believe, is Jonathan Small. He's small and active, with his right leg off, and wearing a wooden stump which is worn away on the inner side. He's been a convict. <laughs> As for the other man... Ah, the other man. He is a, a rather curious person. I hope before very long to be able to introduce you to the pair of them. Oh, a word with you, Watson, please. Yes, yeah, coming, Holmes. Watson, you must escort Miss Morstan home. Mm -hmm. Oh, delighted. Then I want you to go to number three, Pinchin Lane. Yes. Down near the water's edge at Lambeth. Mm -hmm. The third house on the right-hand side is a bird stuffer's. Sherman is the name. Sherman, yes. Knock old Sherman up and tell him with my compliments that I want Toby at once. You'll bring Toby back in the cab with you. Toby? <laughs> a queer mongrel with the most amazing power of scent. <laughs> I'd rather have Toby's help than that of the whole detective force of London. A dog. Well, I won't be arguing with you. Now stand clear. When I say three, then give this wife a snake. 
Mr. Sherlock Holmes, what? Oh. A friend of Mr. Sherlock is always welcome. Oh, uh, thank uh, you. Step in, sir. Just keep clear of the back here, sir. He bites. And now, sir, what was it Mr. Sherlock Holmes has wanted? He wanted a dog of yours. Ah, that would be Toby. Yes, yes. Toby was then. Toby lives at number seven on the left here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, Mr. Sherman, I'm much obliged. <laughs> Come on, Toby. <laughs> That's a good fella. Ah, you have him then, Watson. Leave the dog here and come up. Yes, I'd better time to this banister, I suppose. Oh, boy. <laughs> Unprepossessing Bruce, isn't he? <laughs> ah, Toby and I understand one another. <laughs> Oh, Sergeant, lend me your balls, I please. Certainly, sir. Thank you. Now then, I must kick off my boots and socks. Uh, oh, uh, Watson. Yeah? Just carry them for me, will you, please? Where to, Holmes? Um... I'm going to do a little climbing. Hmm. Oh, yes, and I must uh, dip my handkerchief into this clear shirt. There. That'll do. Now, come up through the hole in the ceiling with me for a moment. <laughs> Ah, uh, 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 you observe anything noteworthy about these footmarks? Well, they belong to a child or a small woman. Apart from the size, what's the chief difference? Well, your toes are all crammed together. The other print has each toe distinctly separated. That is the point. Now, would you kindly step over to that roof window and smell the edge of the woodwork? I shall stay over here, as I have this handkerchief in my hand. Yes. By Jove, yes, this is a strong, tarry smell. That's where he put his foot in getting out. If you can trace him, I should think Toby will have no difficulty. Thank you. <laughs> now, while I get out onto the roof, you run downstairs and wait for Toby in the garden below. Very well, Holmes. That you, Watson? Yes, Holmes. Have you got the dogs? Well, I let him loose. This quarter fight feels pretty fun. Yeah, goes. No, 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 Caref careful, Holmes. Oh, do be careful. Oh, well done. <laughs> My boots and stockings, if you please. There you are. Thank you. Oh. It, was, uh, it was easy to follow his course across the roof. No. I tiles were... Well, loosened the whole way, and... Oh, yes. In his hurry, he, he dropped this. Some sort of a pouch made out of beads. Yes, sir. Anything inside? Ah, some more of those thorns. Mm, they're hellish things. Now, oh, Watson, does your leg stand a six-mile trudge? Certainly. Then here you are, doggy. What? 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 Good old Toby. Smell it, Toby. Smell it. What's that you're showing you, Holmes? A handkerchief with a clear set on it. <laughs> and watch him go. What? what? Come on, Watson. He's going to set us a stiff face. Well, I think we, think we can allow ourselves a breather. Uh, we've had no, no very heavy rain since yesterday. They had 28 hours past, but their sense will still lie upon the road. Holmes, how would you describe the wooden leg man with such confidence? The simplicity itself. Two officers who were in command of the convict guard mm. learned an important secret as to bury treasure. A map drawn for them by an Englishman named Jonathan Small. Jonathan Small? You remember we saw the name on the chart Miss Morstan showed us. Oh, that's right, yes. Small had signed it on behalf of himself and his associates. The sign of the four, as he somewhat dramatically called it. Ah, yes. Well, aided by this child, the officers, or one of them, gets the treasure and brings it to England. Now then, why didn't Jonathan Small get the treasure himself? The answer is obvious. Oh? Uh, is it? You haven't a pistol with you, have you? No, I have my stick. Hmm. 
I shall leave Jonathan to you, but if the other turns nasty, I shall shoot him dead. Come along now. Toby is anxious to be getting off. Well, he's baffled again. There's nothing but the river from here. Yes, but out of luck. They've taken to a boat. Stone it? No. These fellows are sharper than I expected. Daddy! Daddy! Oh, what, Mark? You come back to me, Walt. Come back to young If you hold the phone call and find it like that, they let us hear about it. Oh, dear little chap. A fine child, Mrs. Smith. Oh, this sir, is that. Here, how do you know my name? Uh, the signboard over your door. Mordecai Smith. Oh, that. Uh, away, is he? Uh, I wanted to speak to Mr. Smith. Well, he's been away since yesterday morning, sir. But if it was about a boat, sir, maybe I could serve as well. Uh, I see from the board that he has a steam launch. Uh, that's what I'd like to have. Well, bless you, sir. It's in the steam launch that is gone. That's what puzzles me. I know the rate more cool and know them would take it to about Woolwich and back. He might have bought some at a wharf downriver. Oh, he might, sir, but it weren't his way. Many a time I've heard them go on about the prices they charge for a few odd bags. Besides, I don't like that wooden legged man with his ugly face and outlandish talk. Uh, a wooden legged man? I roused him up yesterday night, he did. Oh, then I'm unlucky, Mrs. Smith. Oh. I wanted a steam launch, and I've heard good reports of the. Um... Oh. Let me see, what is her name? The Aurora, sir. Ah, oh, yes, of course it is. Uh, she's not an old green launch for the yellow line, uh, very broad on the beam. No, indeed. She's as trim a little thing as any on the river, black with two red streets. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I hope you'll soon hear from Mr. Smith. I'm going down the river. If I should see anything of the Aurora, I shall let him know that you're uneasy. Uh, a black funnel, you say? Uh, no, sir. Black with a white band. Huh? Oh, of course, yes. Uh, it was the sides which were black. Uh, well, uh, good morning, Mrs. Smith. Good morning, sir. Clever. <laughs> the main thing with people of that sort is never to let them think their information can be of the slightest importance to you. If you do, they'll instantly shut up like an oyster. Well, our course seems pretty clear now. What would you do, then? Well, I would engage a launch and go down the river on the track of the Aurora. My dear fellow, it would be a colossal task. She may have touched at any wharf on either side of the stream between here and Greenwich. Destroy the police, then. Worse and worse. What are we to do, then? I want you to take a hansom and return to her to his owner with my compliments. Then drive home, have some breakfast, and get an hour's sleep. It's quite on the cards that we may be afoot tonight again. Very well. I must send a wire. To whom? You remember the Baker Street Irregulars whom I employed in our study in Scarlet Cave? Oh, those little ragamuffins. This is just where they might be invaluable. The wire will be to my dirty little Lieutenant Wiggins. I expect he and his gang will be with us before I have time to finish my breakfast. Future, they can report to you, Wiggins, and you to me. I cannot have the house invaded in this way. Oh, 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 Stay in I'm warning you. However, it's just as well that you should all hear the instructions. Now then, I want to find the whereabouts of a steam launch called the Aurora. Black with two red streaks. Funnel, black with a white band. Owner, Mordecai Smith. She's downriver somewhere. Is that clear? Yes, Governor. The old scale of pay and a guinea to the boy who finds the boat. Thank you, Governor. Oh, here's a day in advance. Now, off you go. Oh, thank you, Governor. Come on, you lot all out. Hey! Hey, what? Down that there. Come on, all of you. Get one. <laughs> Horrible rebel, all right. <laughs> if the launch is above water, they'll find her. In the meanwhile, we can do nothing. You going to bed, Holmes? No. I'm not tired. I never remember feeling tired by work, though idleness exhausts me completely. Now I'm going to think over this queer business to which our fair client has introduced us. 
Wooden leg men are not so common, but I should think the other man must be absolutely unique. Oh, that other man again. Diminutive footmarks, toes never fettered by boots, naked feet, great agility, small poisoned darts. Now, what do you make of all this? Perhaps he's one of those Indians who associated with Jonathan Small. Oh, hardly that. Some Indians are small men, but none could have left such marks as that. Now, let's consult the gazetteer. Now then, what have we here? Antenna Narivo is too far. The Andes, no. Uh, Andaman Islands, situated 340 miles to the north of Sumatra and the Bay of Bengal. Uh, <clears throat> a moist climate, coral reef, sharks, convict barracks. Ah. The Aborigines of the Andaman Islands may perhaps claim the distinction of being the smallest race upon this earth. The average height is rather below four feet. They are fierce, morose, and intractable people who are capable of forming most devoted friendships. Now then, listen to this. Their feet and hands are remarkably small. They have always been a terror to shipwrecked crews, braining the survivors with their stone-headed clubs or shooting them with their poison dart. Oh, amiable fellow. Watson, you look done. Uh, Why not lie down there on the sofa and see if I can put you to sleep? Uh, oh, well, um, <laughs> I don't mind a bit I could do with a few wigs. Dear Watson, I, I hope you slept soundly. Uh, I was afraid our talk would wake you. Talk? I heard nothing. Oh, Wiggins has just been up to report. He says no trace can be found of the launch. Look, can I do anything? I'm, I'm perfectly fresh now. We can only wait. If we go ourselves, the message might come in our absence, and that would cause delay. Yes, but... Well, you can do what you will, Watson, but I must remain on guard. Well, then I shall uh, run over to Camberwell and call on Mrs. Cecil Forrester. She, uh... Asked me to yesterday. On Mrs. Cecil Forrester? I see. Uh, well, of course, on uh, Miss Morstan, too. Ah. Uh, they were anxious to hear what's happened. I understand. I wouldn't tell them too much, though. Women are never able to be entirely trusted. Not the best of them. What's an atrocious sentiment, Holmes? Don't be too late back, my dear Watson. I expect to hear something definite before the night, sir. one of the Sherlock Holmes stories by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. We're presenting it in three parts, and you have just been listening to part two. My name is Norman Shelley. My friend Carlton Hobbs played the part of Sherlock Holmes, and I was Dr. Watson. Michael Hardwick wrote the script for this BBC production from London. And, of course, I look forward to the pleasure of your company again very soon for the third and last part of The Sign of the Fall. The BBC, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. frequent climax to the investigations of Sherlock Holmes. My name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and it was my privilege to share the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. First, let me refresh your memory concerning the case so far, and then I will tell you what happened in the end of the sign of the four. Sir, 
Sherlock Holmes and I were upon the track of Jonathan Small, the one-legged ex-convict responsible for the theft of the Agra treasure, which we were endeavouring to recover on behalf of our charming young client, Miss Mary Morstan. The scent had led us to the River Thames, upon which it seemed the thief and his mysterious accomplice were preparing to escape in the steam launch Aurora. After instructing his young Baker Street irregulars to find where this vessel at present lay, Holmes restlessly awaited the news that would lead to the resumption of the chase. Ah, oh, here I am, Holmes. Anything happened? Nothing yet, Watson. You're just in time to take over watch, though. I say, what's the idea of the sailor outfit? I'm off down the river, Watson. I've been turning it over in my mind, and I can see only one way out of it. Well, surely I can come with you, then. No. You can be much more useful if you remain here as my representative. Some message may come early in the morning. I want you to open all notes and telegrams and act on your own judgment. Can I rely on you? Yes, certainly. Well, get some sleep while you can. If we're in luck, you may have news of some sort before I get back. Oh, uh, very well, Holmes. I should be going with you, but best luck to you. Here's your breakfast, Dr. Watson. Ah, oh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, and uh, Mr. Anthony Jones is here to see you, sir. Ah, come in, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Dr. Watson. Mr. Sherlock Holmes is out, I understand. Yes, he's been out all night, and I can't be sure when he'll be back. Take that chair and join me in a cup of coffee. I don't mind if I do. Ah, how's that? Ah. There you are. Now, may I know what brings you here so early? Well, I got a wire from Mr. Holmes this morning. There he is. What does he say? Uh, go to Baker Street at once. If I have not returned, wait for me. Uh-huh. I am close on the track of the Shelto gang. Oh, yeah. You can come with us if you want to be in at the finish. Ah. Uh-huh. Sent from Poplar. He definitely picked up the scent again. Ah, then he's been on a false chase too, has he? Well, even the best of us are thrown off course sometimes. This may prove to be a false alarm, you understand. But it's my duty as an officer of the law to allow no chance to slip. Isn't that someone come to the door? Ah, uh, perhaps it's Mr. Holmes. <laughs> I say, who are you, my man? What do you mean, coming in like... Is Mr. Sherlock Holmes here? No, but I'm acting for him. If you have a message for him, you can tell it to me. Uh, it was to himself I was to tell it. I tell you, I am acting for him. Uh, uh, was it about Mordecai Smith's boat? Yes. I knows well where it is, and I knows where the men he's after are. And I knows where the treasure is. Look here, my man. It I... was to Mr. Sherlock Holmes I was to tell him. Well, then you must wait for him. No, no. No. I ain't going to lose a whole day to please no one. Wait no. for a bit, my what? friend. You have important information. And you're staying here whether you like it or not. Oh, all right. I think you might offer me some coffee, though. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> I thought my disguise was pretty good, but I hardly expected it would stand that test. <laughs> ah, you rogue. You would have made a rare actor. Those weak legs of yours would be worth, well, ten pounds a week on the stage. But I thought I knew the glint of your eye, though. Oh, did you, Jones? Well, it's nice to get these whiskers and things off for a while. I've been working in that get up all day. You see, a good many of the criminal classes begin to know me especially since our friend Watson's here took to publishing some of my cases. So I can only go on the warpath under some simple disguise like this. You got my word, Jim? Yeah? Uh, that was what brought me here. Uh, here's a coffee, Holmes. Ah, uh, thank you. <laughs> and how's your case, prospered Inspector? I am had to release two of my prisoners, and there's no evidence against the other two. Never mind. We shall give you two others in the place of them. But you must put yourself under my orders. Oh, now, look here. You are welcome to all the official credit. But you must act on the lines that I point out. I shall want a fast police boat to be at the Westminster stairs at 7 o'clock this evening. Well, that's easy, many. Sure. Then I shall want two good men in case of resistance. There'll be two or three in the boat. Uh, what else? When we secure the men, we shall get the pleasure. I think it'll be a pleasure to my friend here to take the box round to the young lady to whom half of it rightfully belongs. Let her be the first to open it. Eh, hey, Watson? It would be a great pleasure to me, Holmes. Rather an irregular proceeding. However, the whole thing is irregular. 
I suppose we must meet at it. Exactly. Uh, the treasure must be handed over to the authorities afterwards, until after the official investigation. Certainly. Uh, is there anything else? Only that I insist upon your dining with us before we set out. Oh, well... I have oysters and a brace of grass with something a little choice in white wines. Watson, you never yet recognized my merits as a husband. <laughs> oh, by the way, Watson... Yes, Holmes. You'd best clean that old service revolver of yours. It's as well to be prepared. Tidy-looking craft. Is there anything to mark her as a police boat? Well, yes, uh, that green lamp on the side. And take it off. Oh. All right. You can tell them to cast off now. Right. Cast off. Yes, sir. Uh, where to? To the tower. Tell them to stop opposite Jacobson's yard. Opposite Jacobson's yard. All right, sir. Splendid craft. We ought to be able to catch anything. Yet that river steamer well behind us. There aren't many launches to beat this, I can tell you. So she'll need to be smart to catch the Aurora. She has a name for being a tripper. Now, I'll tell you how the land lies. Yes. How would Small conceal the launch until he knew how the police inquiries were shaping? If I were in his shoes, I might hand her over to some boat preparer with directions to make a trifling change in her. She would then be removed to his shed or yard, and so be effectually concealed, while at the same time she'd be available again at a few hours' notice. Yeah, that seems logical enough. At Jacobson's yard, I learned that the Aurora had been handed over to them by a wooden-legged man with some trivial directions as to our rudder. At that moment, who should come down but Mordecai Smith, the missing owner? But how did you recognize him? Oh, he bellowed out his name and the name of his launch. I want it tonight, said he, at eight o'clock sharp, for I have two gentlemen who won't be kept waiting. I was lucky enough to pick up one of my boys on the way, so I stationed him as a sentry over the launch. He's to stand at the water's edge and wave his handkerchief to us when they start. I should have had a body of police in Jacobson Yard and arrest them when they came down. Which would have been never. Eh? This man Small is a pretty shrewd fellow. If anything made him suspicious, he'd lie snug for another week. If you might have stuck to Mordecai Smith's homes, he would have led you to their hiding place. I think it's a hundred to one against Smith knowing where they live. Why should he ask questions? Well, there's Jacobson's yard anyway. Where are those masks are standing up? Ah, yes, I see. Ah, yes. Yes, I can see my sentry through these night glasses. There's no sign of a handkerchief yet. Suppose we go downstream a short way and lie in wait for him. It's ten to one that they'll go downstream, but we can't be certain. It'll be a clear night and plenty of moon. Now we must stay where we are. Will you give instructions, please? Very well, as you say. Look, Watson. See how the folks swarm over the under and the gaslight? Yes, they're coming from work in the yard. <laughs> Just a looking rascal. But, but do I see a handkerchief? There, surely. Surely there is a white flutter over yonder. Yes, yes, I can see it plainly. Yeah, and there's the aurora, and going like the devil. Full speed ahead, engineers. Sneak out to that launch for the yellow light. I hope I shall never forgive myself if she proves to have the heels of us. She's very fast, the boat. I doubt we should catch her. We must catch her. Keep it on, Stelfen. Make her do all she can. If we burn the boat, we must have them.
Jonathan Small, I fancy. Ah, damn this mud. Oh, it's on quietly. Give me that. Well, Jonathan Small, I'm sorry that it's come to this. And so am I, Mr. Holmes. But I don't believe I can swing to the job. I give you my word, I never raised a finger against Mr. Sholto. It was that little Alan Tonga who shot one of his darts into him. You are under the charge of Inspector Ethel Ned Jones of Scotland Yard. He's going to bring you up to my rooms, and I shall ask you for a true account of the matter. If you make a keen breast of it, I may be of use to you. No, I shall never hear. I think I can prove that the poison act so quickly that the man was dead before ever you reached the room. Marry you are, sir. I do seem to know as much as if he'd been there. Maybe he didn't take that alive, but there was no choice. Oh, well, then, Joe. We'll be at Boxall Beach, presently. Uh, Dr. Watson. Yes, Mr. I shall land you with the treasure box. It's most irregular, but an agreement's an agreement. And you shall take it round to the young lady yourself. Uh-huh. Uh, you. Where's the key? At the bottom of the river. Ah, we had work enough already through you. Well, Doctor, Miss Morrison might at least uh, see her box. Bring it into the Baker Street as soon as you can. Greatest pleasure. Oh, Miss you. Yes, Miss Morton. I thought I heard a cab drive up. Huh? What news have you brought me? I brought something better than news. Oh? I've brought you a fortune. Is that the Agra treasure? The great Agra treasure. Half of it is yours, and half is Daniel Schultz's. You are a couple of hundred thousand each. There will be few young ladies in England richer than you. If I have it, I owe it to you. <laughs> no, no, it, 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 it's my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, whom you respect. When do you sit down? Don't know yet, beside me, yes. and tell you all about uh, it. I, no, no, I, I have to get round to Baker Street with it as quickly as I can. I, I, I just want you to bring it so that you should be the first to see it. Oh, Who is the key? It's, uh, it's in the sled. Um, the police will soon have it open. No? You don't try to see into it now, Dr. Watson. Well, I don't really think that would be... Oh, but you can't see a woman's curiosity in this way. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on. I insist. Uh, the police might... Oh, as part owner of the content. I, uh... Would you rather? <laughs> of course. Now, what could we use? Well, uh, I just say, uh, I think that's the problem. Well, you have my permission, Doctor. Now then, get me into it under the heart. Good. Now, do you need a little lever? Bravo. Well done. And now, you must lift the lid. Very well. Well, oh, I feel quite nervous. <laughs> it's empty. Oh, thank God. Why did you say that? Because it puts you within my reach. Because I love you, Mary, as truly as ever a man loved a woman. Because this treasure, these riches, sealed my lips. Now that they're gone, I can tell you how I love you. That's why I said, thank God. Then I say, thank God too, John. Whoever has lost the treasure this night, I know that I have given up. Empty? Empty, you 
say, Dr. Watson? Yes, Inspector. Is he so ordinary small? <laughs> yes. No way man has any right to it. Say three men who are in the Andaman convict barracks and myself. And I know they'd have me do just what I've done. Rather than let it go to Kipper, Kim, or Shoto, or Morstan. Get out that bag. Where is it? You'll find the treasure where the key is, and where little Tonga is. In the river. Well, it's in that small. Why didn't you throw the box in as well? A man that was clever enough to hunt me down is clever enough to pick an iron box from the bottom of a river. Now, but trying to pick up what's scattered over five miles or so may be a harder job. This is a very serious matter, small. If you'd had justice instead of hindering us like this, well, this talk about justice. Look how I earned that treasure. Twenty long years in that fever ridden swamp, chained up all night, bullied by every native guard who loved to take it out of a white man. You forget that we know nothing of all this. Before we told your story, we cannot tell how far justice may originally have been on your side. Well, that's true, Miss Holmes. Now, you've been very fair spoken to me. Uh, if you want to hear my story, I'd know which to hold it back. If you please. Uh, keep it short. I shall want you to pull when we get to the station. Very well. Well, it begins when I was 18, and so going in India with the third box. A crocodile in the Ganges nipped off my right leg. Ah, with this piece of timber strapped in his stump, I was useless for anything active. Ah, but lucky for me, I got a good job as overseer on an Indigo plantation. And I was all right till the mutiny. I got into Agra just before the siege closed it up. Well, to cut a long story short. That's right. Get on with it. I joined up with three Indians. An angel Abdullah Khan, Mohammed Singh, and Doss Akbar. In a bit of a plot to get some treasure off a refugee merchant. Mind, that wasn't none of my idea. Oh, no, of course not. They couldn't work it without me, and they put it to me at the point of a knife. Join them, or he kept them in. <laughs> well, I killed the merchant. I never touched him, mind. I hid the body in the fort. Well, there was no use dividing the treasure while we were under siege, so he had that too. I drew four plans of road was, and we put the sign of the four of us at the bottom and swore that we should each always act for all. Leave out the fine sentiments. Well, the mutiny was broken, and we thought we were safe. But the merchant's body was found, and so now we were suspected. We were brought to trial. We all got penal servitude for life. Wasn't the treasure found then? Not a word of it came out of the trial. And well, there we were, shipped off to the Andamans to serve our time and work a fortune we couldn't touch. Hmm. Well, after a few years, I was put to dispensing for the surgeon. Yeah, they gave me a little hut next to his quarters. Now, some of the officers used to come and play cards with him in the evenings. There was Major Shoto and Captain Morrison and some others. Well, I used to over him talking, and it pretty soon struck me that Major Shoto was falling in for some pretty big losses. Yes, please. One evening, I heard him say, it's all up, Morrison. I'm a ruined man. So when the captain had walked off his quarters, I nipped out and asked the major if I could have his advice. What about, says he? Oh, well, sir, I said, I happen to know where half a million in hidden treasure lies. And I thought if I told the proper authorities, it might get my sentence shortened for me. Get on with it. I could see him think it over like. Well, the upshot of it is that he comes back next day with Captain Morstan and a little, what you might call, unofficial proposition. You don't mean to say it, mind. I didn't betray my friends. We held a little meeting, the three Indians and the two officers and me, and it was decided Major Sholto would go to Agra and recover the treasure. Then he sent a small yacht provisioned for a voyage. The Indians and I would get away in it, Captain Morrison would apply for leave to go to Agra, and we'd all meet there for a final share out of the treasure. Uh, I'd say this way, small, if this is a year on your spinning, I've never heard the like of it before. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? I think you were hearing the truth. Ah, and you can guess what happened next. That villain showed all went off to Agra, but he never came back. No yacht to fetch us, nothing. Well, what else did you expect? An officer's word, sir. Well, if four convicts could keep faith with each other, then you might have thought that, oh, let's hear the rest of it. Well, from that day, I lived only to escape and track down Shoto. Ah, but it was weary years before my time came. One day, a uh, little Andaman Islander was picked up in the woods, sick nearly to death with fever. He was venomous as a young snake. But as I nursed him round, he took quite a fancy to me. Was this Tonga? That's right, sir. He was a fine boatman, and he owned a big roomy canoe. He didn't need much talking into getting me away from that place. Now we got to Singapore. From there we wandered about the world until we reached England three or four years ago. I earned our living showing Tonga off at fairs as a cannibal. He used to eat raw meat and do a war dance. I was staunch and true with little Tonga. Don't say nothing about him. Give back the shelter. Ah, it wasn't long before I found where he lived. But I was too late. We went to his place and looked through the window of his room. 
He was lying in bed with his sons at either side of him. Even as we watched him, he died. Well, I got into the room that night. I searched these papers, but there wasn't a line about where the treasure might be. And before I left, I thought of my poor Indian friends still back there in the Andamans. I wanted to leave our mark behind. So I scrolled down the side of the four of us on a piece of paper, and I pinned it on him. Oh, that explains that then, Yeah. Pray continue, Small. Well, after a while, I heard that the treasure had been found at the top of Pondy Cherry Lodge. Well, I couldn't hope to get up there, not with this leg. So I brought Tonga with me, with a long rope wound down his waist. He could climb like a cat. But as ill luck would have it, our Tonga and Soto was still in the room when Tonga got in. The little devil killed him with his blow pipe. Thought he'd done something very clever until I, I gave it to him with the rope's end. Anyway, there was nothing else to do but lower the jewels down, leave the sign of the floor on the table, and get away as quick as we could. And there you are, gentlemen. I told it all. And every word of the truth, I swear. A fitting wind up to an extremely interesting case. There's nothing you told you to me in the latter part, hmm? except that you brought your own work. That I didn't know. By the way, I had hoped that Tonga had lost all his bark, yet he managed to shoot one at us in the boat. I had it here. I didn't see you find that, Holmes. You'll examine your hat when you have a moment, my dear Watson. I managed to pick it out without your notice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, sir, he did lose them all except the one he had in the blowpipe ready, you see. Ah, of course. Well, Mr. Holmes, uh, you're a man to be human, but uh, duty is duty. I feel no days in the have our story till here, safe under lock and key. All right, I shall make any trouble. Of course, you'll both be wanted at the trial. Good night, dear. Good night, gentlemen, both. Good, Good night. night. <sighs> well, Holmes. There's the end of our little drama. Thank you, Watson. Mm. Well, good help. And to you. I, uh, I'm afraid it may be the last chance I shall have of studying your method, Holmes. Oh? Why, sir? Miss Morstan has done me the honor to accept me as the prospective husband. I shared as much. I really can congratulate you. There's any reason to be dissatisfied with my choice. Oh, not at all. I think she's one of the most charming young ladies I've ever met. But love is an emotional thing. And whatever is emotional is opposed to that true, cold reason which I place above all things. I shall never marry myself, lest I bias my judgment. <laughs> I trust my judgment may survive the audio. Uh, you're wary, Holmes. Yes. The reaction is already upon me. I shall be as limp as a rag for a week. Strange how terms of what in another man I should call laziness alternate with your fits of splendid energy and vigor. Yes. Well, I need the makings of a very fond loafer. And also a pretty surprise, actually. <laughs> stories of Sherlock Holmes, written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And now you know how it ended. My name, my, my real name, is Norman Shelley. My friend, Carlton Hobbs, played Sherlock Holmes, and I was Dr. Watson. Wedding bells are ringing for me now, it seems. Michael Hardwick wrote the script for this BBC production from London. And need I say, I look forward to the pleasure of your company again, and soon for more of the adventures of Sherlock Holmes.